Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For those of you who doesn't know me, my name is Stefan Ludenberg, and I have a passion for pensions. In today's webinar, we're going to meet with Ole Settegren from the Swedish Pension Authority. Ole, he's the engineer behind the Swedish Notional DC system, and he's been part of it since the beginning. So we can ask him all the ins and outs about that system. So that's going to be an exciting discussion today. But as usually, you are a very important part of the discussion. And when you have questions to Ole, you can type it immediately in the chat. And for the second half hour, we will basically answer your questions and take this opportunity to learn more about the Swedish Notional DC system, because it's a bit like everybody heard of it, but very few know how it works. So with that, Ole, I wish you welcome to Pioneering Pensions. Thank you, Stefan. It's a pleasure to have you here. And we've known each other for many, many years, talking pensions uh, in different forms. And I always find the Swedish Notional DC system extremely interesting. And it's based on a reform back in the mid 90s where Sweden did quite a big change of its pension system and introduced the Notional DC. So Ole, can you give us a bit of a background of this reform and what were sort of the big achievements in it? Yes, uh, I would happily do that. I, I, you, you presented me as the engineer. I'm, I'm not the engineer. I'm one of, of those who, who uh, designed this, this pension plan. And, and mainly I, I should say that the engineers were actually politicians uh, back in, at, at the time. Uh, and their, their main focus for the new pension plan and some would perhaps say over-focus was financial sustainability. The overreaching aim of the reform was financial stability. However, there was also a ambition, of course, of the uh, replacement rate. And uh, quite paradoxically, <laughs> the... the um, the target replacement rate for an average production worker was the same as in the uh, previous pension plan that, that this NDC system replaced. And, and how could you solve that paradox? Well, it was solved by the uh, requirement that the replacement rate would be the same if uh, either life expectancy remained the same as it were in 1995 or that um, retirement age should be delayed uh, according to the uh, increase in uh, life expectancy and i think that um, feature of the ndc plan that it was not necessary to explicitly increased retirement age was what made Swedish politicians able to agree on this pension plan because it, it solved the financial sustainability issue without the uh, need to formally raise the retirement age. Thank you, Ole. And when you talk about the previous pension system, that was a defined benefit system with roots in the late 50s. And they, they realized this wasn't going to be financially sustainable. But what was sort of the, you talk, there's a core principle, right? You should get roughly proportional to what you put in to what you get out. Was that the sort of design lead? Do you mean for the NDC scheme? Yes. Yes, then the C scheme works on a very basic principle, and that is that you, in expectancy, would get your money back uh, from the um, public earnings related pension plan, uh, at least if you discount your, your contributions and pensions with the average earnings growth, which is, I think, and, and was considered a reasonable discount rate. rate. Uh, then you would expect to receive your money back. If you also could expect an average uh, lifespan, yeah. which is, of course, not true for men and women because there's a unisex 
uh, life expectancy um, in, in, in the scheme. Yeah. And when you talk about financial stability, does it mean also, I understood from our previous conversation that they were very strict on that. They said no benefits without paying something in and you will not there will be no charges without benefits. So can you give us no, a there's a, more? It's a very, very strict relationship between contributions and accredited pension uh, entitlement in the scheme. Uh, and, and that was a, a, a factor which made the political discussions very disciplined because you could have no, uh, no pension benefits without contribution and, and no contributions without benefit. And the, the politicians, they agreed on that principle and that, I think, disciplined the, the, the process and also made the legislation quite uh, logic and, 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 and clear. And when you talk about the politician, that was a bipartisan agreement across sort of the traditional left and right boundaries, right? Yes, and I think that perhaps the uh, the preconceived opinion on uh, politics in Sweden is that uh, there's a, a, an ability to compromise in Sweden, which is uh, substantial. But at least if you live in Sweden, that ability seems to be exaggerated. Uh, but in this case, there was a, a political compromise. But And I think it's rather atypical for Swedish politics rather than typical. So this was more like uh, luck than uh, the typical way it's going. Yeah, uh, luck or an exceptional situation. I think the Social Democrats, they were very uh, concerned that they would be associated with a uh, pension plan that had gone bankrupt. Uh, so they had incentives to um, move away from it. And the political center right they had always liked uh, to to change pension plan and you, you mentioned something which i find quite intriguing and that is mem people in sweden can choose when to retire so uh, if you retire later you're going to get more money and, and as you said the politicians didn't have to increase the retirement age but if you as an individual would retire later in relation to chip to your life expectancy you would roughly get what the previous system had. What did people do? They did not retire later. <laughs> they they kept uh, retiring at around 65. Uh, and uh, so that was the, the uh, a large uh, failure, I would say, uh, of the, the uh, pension reform. And there are several reasons why the retirement age did not increase. Uh, and, and one, perhaps the most important reason, is that there's a, a complementary benefits. The guaranteed benefit kicks in at 65, and that age was not changed. And also, social insurance, like disability benefits, stops at 65. That age was not changed. Uh, and also, the social partners, they... They counteracted the reform in a sense that they increased their um, their payments to their occupational pension plans. So the financial incentives or need to uh, delay retirement has not been uh, so strong. But but there has been a, a decline in replacement rate in the public earnings related plan, and that has stressed politicians a lot. So now. Uh, as w one result of that stress has been that finally Sweden actually changed uh, the surrounding age limits and also the earliest pickup age of the earnings related pension plan and they are now increasing at a very rapid rate. I think that's a very important lesson if you're going to build a system you need to make sure that all parts of the system play together otherwise it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, uh, A lot of people find notional DC difficult to understand and I assume when you have been talking to politicians and journalists and others how how do you explain the notional DC in layman terms well 
In basically, I think, and, and uh, I think it's not only a subjective opinion, I, I think it's objectively a simple uh, structure. It's like a, a bank, but rather pension savings. All the contributions, they are accumulated in your account. The account is visible and you can look into it. And there's an interest rate just as you have at a bank account and the interest rate in this notional DC is the average earnings growth in Sweden. And when you arrive, you also have um, survivor bonuses like in a, a normal a private pension plan and you have deductions for administrative costs. My, my salary and so forth, my colleagues' salaries are deducted from this account. And when the insured reaches the age where she or he wants to retire, uh, that notional capital is divided by the uh, life expectancy at, at that time. Uh, and it's yearly calculated new uh, life expectancy for, for each birth cohort. However, after that birth cohort reaches the normal retirement age, which is now reintroduced, uh, the the divisors the uh, annuities are, are not changed. What, so um, it's it's, yeah. it's it's like a bank savings. I would say it's very similar to bank savings. And then then you, but you can't pay, you can't take your money out all at once. You can only take them out as in the form of a life annuity. So mm -hmm. it's a super super simple structure. Uh, if people want to know more about how the mechanics work, you actually have an annual report, haven't you, where you explain all the details? Yes, there's a rather, or I think a completely unique feature of the Swedish NDC scheme that there is a complete uh, income statement and balance sheet for this, um, this uh, pay-as-you-go pension scheme. And it's also calculated rather uh, surprisingly only with experienced... Um, transactions, it's backward looking, it's not forward looking in a sense. However, there's an implicit discounting of assumed future contributions, but it's in a sense also backward looking that that type of net present value calculation. So that means you don't have to have a future expected investment returns or expected growth in, in real wages or something like that. No, no such things. The, 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 it's all if if wages increases a lot or life expectancy increases a lot, it will be accounted for when we've registered it. Not in it's never anticipated. Hmm. I was wondering. It's been like almost three decades since the reform, and if you look at the machine itself, how has it worked over these years? So the, well, the machinery in the. At, Machinery and administration, I think, has worked uh, worked smoothly, and also the the phasing out of the old plan, which is quite a complex uh, operation, uh, and introduction of the new plan. It it was phased in over a twenty year period. It's now now completely phased in. However, there there are lots of pensions under payment that are uh, uh, calculated according to the old plan. But but now all new pensions are calculated according to new rules. Uh, and that has worked smoothly. And also, if you think about the expectations you had when setting out the system, has it also worked well? Or has some of these variables like wage growth not being good enough? Or is it like meeting the expectation people had when they started the system? Well, <laughs> Uh, it's difficult to say because uh, you need to enter the expectations of people. but But... The, and those uh, expectations, uh, what they were, I don't really, can't really uh, tell. But there's at least two happenings that have been rather unexpected. And, and one is that the scheme has accumulated a very large surplus. And that was not expected. Uh, the scheme was <laughs> designed rather to be able to... to uh, um, handle a situation where it was needed to do deviations, negative deviations from the average earnings growth indexation. Uh, but uh, there, 
demographic development in Sweden with the very large migration has made the pay-to-go pension plan go uh, with a surplus. However, this positive uh, fact sh should be should be balanced by the fact that the migrants will uh, cause larger costs than the surplus from the government uh, budget in terms of tax finance supplementary benefits in the pension plan. So, so, so it's a net minus according to our calculations from migration. However, there's a large surplus in the pay-to-go pension plan. Yeah, I think and, that's, that's good to point out that in the Swedish pension system, the, the scheme we're talking about, the national DC, is one of many components that an old person going to get money from. And depending on what you have in your background, how much savings you have, you get more or less of, of a means-tested type of benefits. So when you're thinking about this system, it in its closeness, it's worked really, really well. But then, of course, the, the average Swede doesn't just have this system. They face with all of the other ones as well. And Uli, you said there's roughly like seven different ways you can get benefits in Sweden, right? Like in, seven in sort of different overall... ways from the government, pension benefits. Yeah. Yes, and uh, it's uh, according to the Swedish Pensions Agency, um, overly complex and uh, uh, not rational. Um, and uh, recent developments have made the pension plan uh, more complicated and more contradictory. Uh, so, so there is uh, a rather peculiar and difficult um, situation. Well, for people who are not Swedish, they might find this a bit complicated. So. I know that the notional DC is one of the system. The premium pension, also known as PPM, is, is another one. What are the other five? Well, there's the guaranteed pension that has been there from the start, which is a, it's a top-up benefit. If your earnings-related benefits is not uh, high enough, there's a, a supplement paid. Uh, and then there's a housing allowance that... Uh, because this, uh, this guaranteed pension will not give you sufficiently to live on if you, if you have to pay for your own housing, you could say. So if you live with someone who has a decent income, you will only get the guarantee if you had a, have had a low lifetime earnings or a normal lifetime earnings. Uh, but if you're a single person with normal lifetime earnings, the guarantee will not be sufficient and you will get a housing allowance. And then there's a special housing allowance. And then there's also a sort of social assistance benefit for, um, for uh, persons, mainly people who have uh, immigrants that have had too few years in Sweden to earn a full or earn a full guaranteed benefit. Um, so, so those are the, the five uh, mm -hmm. complements. Well, that means you, you say the notional DC and the PPM is roughly related to what you earn, yes. and then you're going to get this additional benefit. And how does it work out for ordinary people? How many people get these additional benefits, or how does it work? Well, prior to the changes that Parliament enacted in 2020, uh, it was 33% received some additional uh, benefit. Very often it's a very little amount, but there's a few few Swedish kroner uh, of supplementary tax finance benefits. But when those changes were made in, in 2020, uh, the number of retirees that receive complementary tax finance benefits is up to 70%. Um, so, so it's been a very dramatic change. Still, there's often very few, few Swedish kroner in this that that the majority of these uh, persons receive. But it makes the marginal tax rate in the contribution to be very high. Well, for, for if you're like an ordinary Swedish person who's been working in healthcare, for example, your whole life. 
Yeah. And do you get this, the more money you put in, the more you get out if you add everything up? Or do you more or less get this a flat pension like in Netherlands? If you have the housing allowance, which is means tested and, and on a household level, the, the, I would say no, you would not get more if, if you earn more. Uh, if you don't have the housing allowance, you will get a little bit more if you earn more. But the uh, implicit tax rate on those contributions to the earnings related plan is, is, is around 50% or, or more. Wow. So at the end of the day, what you're saying is Sweden has a very, very complicated system for doing what the UK and Netherlands have in practice for most people to have almost like a, a, a flat level income in, in retirement. Where am I pushing it too far? No, I, I think you're uh, close to right uh, or, or even spot on. Uh, and and uh, the Swedish Pensions Agency has discussed this in a report that we presented uh, this spring uh, that where we we asked the government to 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 start an inquiry into these issues uh, to to investigate if, is this really the situation that Sweden wants to to be in with its pension plans uh, they are they are much simpler way to deliver this rather uh, compressed uh, same same pension net of the tax and housing allowance to 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 many people than than the structure that Sweden has opted for. So we have our previous guest Alfred Slacher. He has a question for you, which is related to to what can as other countries learn from Sweden when it comes to notional DC. But instead of me repeating that question, let's roll the tape and hear what Alfred has to say. What sort of tips or suggestions would he be uh, would he give given his no the, the inside knowledge about uh, the notional DC uh, for the Dutch? We were currently in implementation phase of the pension reforms. But what sort of something? If you that zooms out, simple. Wait a minute. Something. Is, uh, what could you improve or avoid? But some of the, the Germans they are of course starting. I think their fourth or fifth pension reform right now. Uh, there too, uh, inspired, of course, by, by parts of the, the notion of DC. So, similar question there for him. So, uh, with his background, what sort of tips and suggestions would he have for the Dutch and the German reforms? Alfred, thinking about the workplace pension, uh, to a large extent, I think, in the Netherlands. Um, but, yeah, please go ahead. Well, what could other countries learn from the Swedish NDC scheme? Um, there are some, some perhaps more positive uh, um, experiences, and that is perhaps that it is possible to uh, to design a a financially sustainable uh, pay as you go pension plan uh, that is reasonable and, and has reasonable properties, and that it also, if you do it right. Ca- can have this property that it's very transparent in its accounting and comprehensible, I would claim, that are perhaps academic aspects that are interesting. Uh, I I think also the very large uh, extensive flexibility when it comes to uh, retiring when you want to and continue to work and and, uh, pick up a benefit if you want those type of features, the Swedish pension plan deals with that in a sense that I think is close to perfect. Uh, high flexibility and, and um, it's also administratively smooth. It, it took a lot, a lot of programming, but it, it works. Uh, so those are the positive, perhaps, experiences. And then some uh, more negative experiences is that this this idea that retirement age would would increase just from incentives uh, has not worked. Uh, also, the idea that the, this and to the extent that the idea was that this pension plan would would be outside politics and work according to its rules uh, has not worked either. Uh, it 
it worked for almost 20 years, but then uh, then it uh, didn't work any longer. Uh, so, so in that sense, there is. Um, it was perhaps obvious that it would not work, but the 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 idea was that it should should keep up, <laughs> and it didn't. But, but you would say that the notional DC machinery, you said it worked, but it was sort of the other benefits you put around yes. it. Yes. Instead that's, of letting yes. letting it be financially sustainable, you had the machine was financially sustainable, but not the benefits around the machine. No, that's that's correct. It was considered that benefits became too low uh, and uh, rather than sort of going into the NDC machinery and changes, which which could be done, but it, it takes a lot of political uh, <laughs> energy to do that. And that energy was not there, at least not in, in unanimity. So uh, the solution was to, to increase some pensions by adding a new benefit on on top of the the earnings related pension plan that is tax financed but but sort of ruins the principles within the ndc scheme without yeah. changing the ndc scheme the ndc scheme yeah. is, is is still there intact below what's been put up on top of it yeah and we think like if you're in latin america where you still have a good demographics and you realize going to be a lot of baby boomers coming on, this can actually be quite a good way to make the system work if you're so, but you need the political willingness to do it and the political ability to managing it year after year after year. So when you're thinking about that, Ole, looking back, would you say that the reform in the 90s, was this a good reform or was it uh, a not so good reform? You don't have to answer if you don't want to. But. Well, no, but um, uh, I, I think it has um, largely, uh, largely failed uh, the the intentions. Then I think the intentions I supported and and the mechanics I supported. But if if it can't uh, survive the political. Uh, uh, if it can't survive in in the demo, democratic uh, surroundings that that should support the system, it it, it is not uh, successful. It has not been successful. Well, that was a tough uh, sentence of the system, but I think I agree with you. It's it's really important to make a system that can do well in good times and bad times, but then you need political willingness to stick to it. We have some questions now from the audience. Yeah. It's from Jens Christian Stugard. Ole, thanks for sharing your great insights. Can you say something about the outcome of the NDC system, how it turned out for lower wage part-time workers compared to what was expected when the system was put in place? Uh, there's, I think, relative to the earlier pension plan, there was a very good chance for those who had been part-time workers uh, for many years, but then they decided to work full-time the last 15 years of their careers. They were uh, very much uh, favorized by, by the previous pension plan, by the rules of that pension plan. Uh, so, so in that sense, it they, they made losses, but if you were part-time worker, the last 15 years of your uh, working career, you were at a very large disadvantage and you will be favored by the new pension plan. And the new pension plan in, in essence uh, favorizes uh, very much, at least if you consider replacement rate, those who have long careers and and rather flat earnings development which at least in sweden is a typical blue collar worker if you have a flat earnings career and you start relatively uh, early but also continue uh, relatively late then the ndc scheme is advantageous relative to the earlier plan and 
also if you haven't done enough you have the other systems around right that lift you up a bit yes but and it gave similar results in the in the in the present scheme as in the uh, earlier scheme they were managed to, to retain a lot of the status quo then so yes in practice it wasn't that much change for the individual yes that's correct so we have a question from john mitchum here we in the anglo countries united states australia canada and the uk study the collective spirit behind the nordic funded retirement with some envy how would you contrast the anglo and the nordic models i guess this is about the premium pension <laughs> It might be. I think it's more generically as well, because in the rest of the world looks at Nordic has a very good pension system. The Nordic countries end up pretty high in the Mercer pension index. So yeah. what is sort of the secret behind the Nordic model? Well, well <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's a more Nordic model. I might be, be short sighted, but it's, it seems to me that Finland uh, relative to Sweden has a very different pension situation. Denmark as well. Sweden and Norway are quite quite similar, uh, but uh, otherwise the Nordics are not so similar according to my, my perception. Uh, but the, the collective spirit in the premium pension part, the, 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 the pre-funded premium reserve DC plan, uh, there is a collective spirit there uh, in that the life expectancy risk is dealt with collectively you can't outlive your your funds even you though you have the the right to choose any of it was 800 funds now it's it's around five six hundred funds and it will probably probably decline the you can't outlive, outlive your capital because the swedish pensions agency does all the 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 sort of risk uh, management of, of those um, those uh, uh, life expectancy uh, risks. So, so, so that that dealt with uh, collectively in a very sm smooth uh, way, and there's no annuity market behind it. The, the annuities are decided administratively, you could say. Uh, so, so, and that works according to me very well. Uh, and that's due to the centralized uh, management mm. of the premium pension plan. But, but also uh, there are occupational pension plans that has this collective um, life risk um, uh, administration. So for those who are not familiar with Sweden, a bit of clarification is that the PPM is part of the state pension, so it's managed by sort of the government then it's under the pension authority and there you everybody has to pay in you have no choice and you, you have to pool your longevity and there's no choice either but what with those constraints it, it managed to offer you a lifelong income with quite a lot of flexibility and the Netherlands has a similar model where they basically say all workplace pension has to be taken as a lifelong income as well so Maybe the secret is that it's been quite a, an, I say, strong hand pulling you in to get a lifelong income. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the workplace pension, as we knew, you don't have to take a lifelong income. But for the state pension, I think it's perfectly solid because, you know, it's, um, it's a way to financing old age for the society. Yeah. We have a question from Jonathan Calland. He says, great commentary and learning a lot. Thanks. Uh, John, uh, Jonathan is based in Chile and it's been over 43 years since the mandatory 10% contribution to the IFP real DC system was implemented on May Day 1981. So we have a full track record and mixed results. So he says, even for regular, sorry, when it was scrolled away here, mm -hmm. uh, even for regular contributors, replacement rates are low in terms of final pay, primarily due to significant rises uh, on average three to 4% per annum in real earnings over the same period, leading to insufficient, uh, the part under the triangle contributions. 
What are the current replacement rates and average real earning increase in Sweden? Well, um, replacement rates are <laughs> uh, much dependent on how you define them. But I would say, uh, according to how Swedish pensions agency choose to define them, they are uh, around 70 to 80 percent uh, higher than 80 percent for low income earners due to um, guaranteed pension in a, in a to a large extent so so somewhere there 70 to 80 percent and, also and that earnings growth well earnings growth has been around real earnings growth has been around one point eight uh, 1.9 percent the last 20 years but how has it been the last couple of years Ole, with uh, the the, the last rate? year and this year there's been a very very large very substantial um, negative real earnings growth um, inflation has been uh, around uh, close to 10 percent and and earnings has been around three or three or four percent so there's a largest drop in real earnings that uh, i have in my time series that starts 1960 so it's perhaps the largest the real earnings growth uh, since the 30s in in sweden and what what effects does it have on the pension system well it 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 makes um the guaranteed benefit and other complementary benefits relatively larger uh, in comparison to the earnings related pensions so it increases sort of the marginal tax rate in the contribution that's that's a bit of a challenge then and perhaps that's also explained why the gap has why when so many people said 70 percent get something of the the, the 70 percent is, is mainly due to to <laughs> to change legislation but this economic development has contributed uh, to it okay mm -hmm. uh, john mitchum again he says thanks ole we do perceive that the nordic model has achieved pooling of longevity risk in the anglo zone it feels like every man slash woman for him slash herself yeah, that's my perception as well. Yeah. Well, one thing I wondered is that is that relatively new? Has it always been that case? Because if you look at UK uh, before Margaret Thatcher, it wasn't that different, right? Well, I can't answer that, but uh, no. I guess you're right, Stefan. <laughs> if someone in the audience have a comment on that, please put it in the chat. Uh, Akim fully. Gembizola, he says, how does the Swedish notional DC compare with Singapore's Central Provident Fund? Well, I think the Singapore Central Provident Fund is, is a fund, funded uh, reserve, funded capital. The Swedish NDC is largely unfunded. However, there's a large buffer fund in the Swedish NDC. It represents some five and a half years of pension payments or around 16, 17% of the pension liability. But I think the Singapore um, Providence Fund represents 100% of the pension liability, but I'm not sure about that. So I'm just gonna jump on your buffer funds. So you could say that the buffer funds is also there to take care of the baby boomers. So if you have a demographically, a big demographic hump walking, going through your population over the years, the buffer fund can be a way to make the system generational neutral. Is that yes. how you should view it? Yes. In essence, that's it. Yes. Yeah. We have a question here from Sergio uh, Nistico. He says, Hi, Ole. Can you say something about those who criticize the NDC scheme for not taking into account differences in life expectancy across different social groups? 
That's a difficult question, Ole. Yes. It's a good question and difficult. Hello, Sergio. I, I, I'm a friend of Sergio. So, <laughs> uh, or, uh, so, so it's correct that the NDC scheme does not uh, take into account uh, uh, differences in life expectancy in, in uh, social economic groups. Uh, however, one uh, perhaps bad defense for that uh, property is it's similar with all other pension plans that they don't take uh, into account such differences. Most other pension plans that I know of anyhow. Uh, then one, one aspect that was very important for the Swedish Social Democrats for supporting the NDC scheme was this uh, property that I tried to explain earlier that those with long lifetime earnings that had a rather flat um, career effect are at uh, are advantageously uh, dealt with in the NDC scheme relative to, to uh, defined benefit plans that take into account late earnings uh, a lot. So in some sense there's a positive aspect for for uh, normal workers uh, in the NDC plan due to that. And also I would say it was very important in Sweden to to have the same uh, life expectancy for men and women in in calculating the benefit. And if you open up this aspect of taking into account uh, subgroups life expectancy you would you need winners and you need losers uh, and and if you um, allow for taking into account different life expectancy it would perhaps be difficult to argue that women should not have lower benefits due to their higher uh, life expectancy uh, and that would have been politically uh, impossible. Um, and also, of course, all the practical dif practical difficulties in in deciding uh, the life expectancy of different collectives uh, and defining the collectives uh, is, of course, a, a major obstacle. And, and one of the another big argument against having such considerations is that. One idea of social insurance is to to make the whole whole nation uh, one insurance collective and treat the risks as if they were uh, the same uh, and dividing up into different si subgroups according to their risk properties would be sort of uh, contradictory to, to social insurance. Um, there's arguments against all what I've said of course, but but those were the arguments that I came up with right now. It's also quite intriguing because when you talk to people in Netherlands or in the UK, where you get the same amount, everybody gets the same amount in retirement, and people don't really discuss the unfairness of different life expectancy and so, but it's in the system, but it's how you frame it and how you present it for people who feel more or less, I say, how do you want more or less uh, fairness? I typically say the Swedish system is probably the most fair system if you terms what you pay in, what you get out, at least the NDC machine. And Netherlands is a very unfair system because it doesn't matter how much tax you pay, you get more or less the same pension coming out. But people in Netherlands, they think they have a very good system because it's fair because you get all the same from, from the state. While in Sweden, a lot of people are upset on uh, that actually it's unfair because I work more than the other person and I'm not getting enough money. So it's quite intriguing how you frame the pension discussion, Ulle. Yes, yes. So we have a question here from Jonathan, a follow-up question actually. He says, going back to the negative relearnings, does that, that means it improves the replacement rates. So has it been good for the NDC system? Uh, in short, I would say that the uh, replacement rate from the public pension plan has uh, dropped uh, from around 
60 to around 50 percent for a uh, average uh, production worker it's a hypothetical oecd hypothetical uh, typical case and this is mainly this is explained mainly from the increased life expectancy and the constant uh, retirement age but in total, the replacement rates in Sweden have been stable at this around 70 to 80 percent due to increases in occupational pension during the same time when the public pension has decreased somewhat. Yeah, so we, we talked about the system, so not just what you get from the state, but also your workplace pension. Yeah. That's why this is such a complicated mm -hmm. issue for most people. Yeah. And, and if retirement ages would have increased in, in line with life expectancy, replacement rates would have increased about 10, 15 percent. Yeah. So the life expectancy is a good thing. You get more life, you get more years to, to enjoy, but you get less money to to spend, but I think everybody can understand that equation. Actually. Yeah, but but so far in total, there has not been less money uh, on average in Sweden. So that's that's a good good sign. We have from Joao Barata. He says, commenting on the Anglo world, uh, the change mainly from DB funds to DC funds definitely have an impact on how longevity risk is shared and not shared by the man woman in the UK. And I think that's a good good observation. Um, we also have from John Mitchell. Uh, yeah, I think he didn't really finish that question. So if you do, John, can you finalize it? Um, Jonathan, he has a question here. He says, Ole, I enjoy the way you tackle the unisex mortality issues. Hence, individual competitive annuities may offer the most reasonable approach. What do you think about that? A competitive annuity. Well, like you, you check where you live and uh, if you're a smoker, etc., etc. So, and, and companies are competing, so they're trying to bid themselves to get the business. Okay. The, the, the problem, as I see it, with, with sort of market-based annuities, is that uh, there seems to me to be a large uh, adverse selection effect uh, in at least if you have the options uh, and that may if i understood it correctly this has made insurers to to price annuities in a very disadvantageous way for uh, for retirees and and the advantage with having the these administratively decided annuities is that you and of course it comes from the not having any option they are all compulsory uh, made these annuities uh, is that you don't have any adverse selection problems yeah well, i think that's a good point because what do you do with those who are uninsurable that the industry don't really want well the thing is with pensions and and that was back to Sergio's issue perhaps Pensions is, in a sense, not the, the, there should not need, be no need for politics there, according to the risk, because they are the, the rich people who live long. Uh, so you would not need a politically decided pension plan for that reason. Uh, and poorer people and people who have had a tough life have lower life expectancy. So you have such a, a risk or, or a redistribution of income that is, that is contrary to what politics is supposed to, to do. Yeah. Now John Mitchum actually put in his full question. So here it says, in the United States, Social Security provides a solid replacement ratio for the lowest quintile of workers. But those workers have substantially lower life expectancy. Their tax benefits, the state taxes benefits uh, the tax benefits, higher income quintiles with better health care slash longevity. Would a lump sum option be used to improve equity of retirement finance? 
I, I don't answer the question, but I <laughs> I can, can can put forward my opinion that I don't think lump sums uh, should be should be used for pensions. Um, to, but but I know that it's a controversial opinion in in uh, some uh, some cultures and countries. But in Sweden, it's uh, it's rather the opposite that lump sums are not considered to be social. <laughs> I think what John he, he right the point here says if if everybody get the same lump sum out of the state and and if you live a shorter life, you're going to get more bang out of it. I am. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That that that's that's uh, correct, of course. That's correct. But then the question is, how do you, who do you pull it with, right? Yeah. No, but that, and that's right. And then you could buy perhaps these market-based annuities, and and people who have lower life expectancy would be rewarded in a sense. Uh, but but uh, I don't think it uh, would work that way, really. Yeah, I think this is if you're thinking about the one of the diff most difficult questions is. How are you going to deal with different levels of longevity? Mm -hmm. And um, for example, also if you're a low income earner or if you're someone who would so have a low life expectancy, pooling longevity in your workplace pension might not be the best thing to do and rather lie on state pension uh, for, for your later year if you get there. But mm -hmm. this makes it really, really difficult to put policy around it because they're so people are so different. Yeah. We have a question from Jonathan. I think this will be the last one because you also have are going to be given the chance to ask a question. Is, is that Jonathan Callan? He says not necessarily such strong anti-selection. In Chile, lower earners are offered rates that consider a lower uh, expectancy. Chile also has a drawdown alternative to annuities. So they are not compulsory. In fact, low earners with target pensions, uh, target pension less than the minimum state pension, cannot buy an annuity. They also benefit from the state-funded pensions. Okay, that's an interesting observation that that uh, that they have actually markedly lower uh, annuity uh, or lower life expectancy for lower uh, lower income income workers. Maybe something for Sweden to take after. Yes, yes. And I would say we have, we always offer our guests, you know, you have answered a lot of our questions. It's been really interesting. And I, I find this notional DC system, it's quite an intriguing construction, particularly if you're in a country where you have a lot of young population now who are expect and in a country that's expecting to age, just the idea of having the buffer funds to, to be able to deal with demographic and make it generational neutral, I think is a really, really important topic. And so I think please study the Swedish notional system. And for the next uh, webinar, next Pioneer Pension, we will have Dr. Sami Sinha. He's the director of Generat Yeratrat. He's, he's a doctor for elderly people, and he's done a lot of work on this in Canada. He's also part of the National Institute of Aging, where he's looking on the health part of getting older. So, so far in Pioneer Pension, we have spent a lot of time looking into the finance or how do you finance pension? How do you make better payout solutions? But here's also interesting. We're going to live longer. What? How is that going to look for us? Are we going to get healthier for longer? What can we do to stay more active? What are the challenges we see as a society with an aging population? So how are we going to deal with um, the aging population in a way that is both financially sound, but also from a health perspective, so you get the most you know, happiness out of the life you have. And that's going to be on January 23rd at 2 p.m. Um, but uh, Ole, what kind of question would you like to ask Samir? Well, I would like to ask him if this idea that retirement age should be pegged to 
life expectancy development is reasonable if he supports it or if it doesn't and for what reason i could say that in sweden there's a a guru in these issues and it's called he's called ingmar eriksson and he has very much promoted the sort of science he claims that the life expect life expectancy development has increased the number of uh, healthy years and and po- uh, potentially productive years uh, so the the increased life expectancy has not been more years of being uh, old it has mm-hmm. increased your normal working life uh, potential uh, i think in some some countries france for example he would be contradicted but in sweden it's it's the absolute fact so ole you and i were looking forward to work up until we're 75 well my, my predicted retirement sort of normal retirement age is is 68 and i'm born in 1964 ole it's been great having you here i really enjoyed this discussion and as always you have a very insightful view on on pensions and i acknowledge you're not the only one who's been building the system but the work you have done and all your colleagues have done and the politicians i think is totally amazing to build a system like this and run it for such a long period so i really hope that the politician realize what they got and and trying to make the system work again um because it's a very good system in its design so it's not the machine that need reforms it's the thing around it so with that to let I would like to thank you and I would like to thank everyone in the audience for being here because it's so fun to discuss these pension questions with like-minded people.